joining uh, Dr. Mendoza and I for our weekly uh, COVID-19 uh, update. I want to start today by uh, 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 briefing our, our briefing today by um, commenting on the horrific events uh, that we all witnessed yesterday uh, at the United States Capitol building. This was not peaceful protesting. It was domestic terrorism. And it was an attempt to block our government from carrying out its constitutional duties. It was un-American at its core. Violence, unrest, and anarchy are not the answer to what is a free and fair election. While we have the right as Americans to disagree on ideology, taking things to the level of violence and chaos are unacceptable. The peaceful transfer of power is a hallmark of our democracy. We're known across the world for how we transition po uh, power and how we transition leadership in this country. I'm proud that our leaders went right back into session yesterday to complete the work of the people and were not deterred by the violence that took place inside the Capitol building. Instead of fighting each other during this time of crisis and reckoning, in the midst of a global pandemic, we should be coming together as a nation, working together as a nation to collect for our collective safety, well-being, and health. I'm calling on all leaders of this community to come together to be unifiers, not dividers, and to get us through the crisis that we're facing uh, at this time. Over the last two weeks, uh, we have been seeing in our COVID-19 numbers um, what I would describe as a, a, a sometimes an alarming increase uh, in our positivity numbers and what we see in our hospitalization numbers. Um, however, over the last, over the uh, holiday weeks, uh, we have seen some glimmers of hope where the numbers look to have stabilized and some days have even gone down. While we've experienced record high case numbers a few times since the holidays, we've also reported lower than average numbers multiple times as well. This isn't because the prevalence of COVID-19 is decreasing in the community. It's because our daily, it, it, the number of positive cases that we get is directly tied uh, to the number of daily testing numbers that we have uh, throughout the community as well. And during the holiday weeks, while the daily testing numbers have gone down, so have the number of daily positive cases. This is evidence if you look at the seven day positivity rate. Our seven day positivity rate continues to hover at just around 10%. And that's why we look at what the averages are and we, always, we usually average it over a seven day period so that it takes out those natural ebbs and flows that you see in our numbers, both in terms of the rate and also in terms of what you see in the raw number of positive cases. To go back just before Thanksgiving, our seven day average daily testing was at its highest at nearly 9,000 tests per day. Whereas this week, we've seen a seven day average of right around 5,000 uh, tests per week, uh, which is well below the peak. So the bottom line is, and the message that I want you all to understand is that while some days are gonna look better than others, and some days may have real low numbers of positive cases, other days are high, what's best and what we like to look at and we think is useful is looking at the seven day average because that's gonna average those high daily testing numbers with the low daily testing numbers and it's gonna give us a better measure uh, of the health of the community. Um, so the bottom line is let's not let a few good days or a few bad days change where we think the trajectory is, but we need to be looking at the average and where we see uh, the, the line going. Um, uh, I have an update on the vaccination effort. Um, outside of the local, of the hospital systems and nursing homes, Monroe County uh, has, as I said two days ago, opened up two small uh, vaccine pods uh, for those eligible to receive the vaccine like first responders and those not affiliated with an employer who will provide it. Uh, our pods right now are working with those who work in private and medical practices, public health clinics, dental practices, physical therapists, speech therapists, behavioral health workers, funeral home and funeral home employees. Um, to provide timely and accurate information, we have added uh, those phase uh, 1A people who are eligible for vaccine to our website. You can go to www.monroecounty.gov. Um, and when you visit our website, you can see if you are eligible for a vaccine under phase 1A. And we also have an online reservation system that you can use to make an appointment uh, to be vaccinated 
uh, at uh, one of the county uh, uh, run pod sites. Um, this is for people, um, if you look at the list and you'll see that on our website, uh, working with the Monroe County pods is for individuals who are outside of the hospital systems who receive their own own direct allocation of vaccines for those who are working there. So I would encourage you, if you fit under one of the 1A guidelines and you're wondering where you go to get a vaccine, you can go to our website and sign up through the portal there um, after you've talked to your employer and also your association. So make sure uh, you can go through that list and you can find all that information, uh, like I said, on our website. Uh, we're continuing to wrap up uh, our efforts on the vaccination clinics as more professions and sectors are added to the list and as we go through uh, the phases. Just last week, we began vaccinating the EMS personnel uh, out at our Monroe County Fleet Center. As of yesterday, um, we had over 1,700 people um, that had gone through there for their vaccine. Um, just a couple days ago, we were at 1,200, we're at 1,700. Uh, at next week, we're hoping to uh, be able, and the plan is to ramp that up to be able to do about 4,000 uh, vaccines a week uh, at that location. And then as the state moves through uh, the phase uh, approach and you get through more phases of 1A and then into 1B, the county uh, is planning on expanding its pod uh, system to be able to help manage the increased number of el eligibility uh, and tie that to the distribution and the availability uh, of the vaccine uh, to us. Uh, so we'll continue to increase those numbers and we'll be able to update you on those as well. Dr. Mendoza will provide additional details on the community-wide vaccination efforts and the date and plans moving forward, but we also want to remind everyone that this is going to be a long and thorough process. It's not going to happen in just one week, not a month, not even in three months. To ensure that the process is done correctly in a fair, transparent, and equitable manner, Dr. Mendoza and I convene the Finger Lakes COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Uh, we uh, asked Dr. Nancy Bennett and Wade Norwood to lead this task force. Uh, the first meeting of the task force is scheduled for later today, and it's bringing together people of all demographics, reflecting the diversity of our region, from urban, suburban, to rural communities, business leaders, medical professionals, community members, and everyone in between. We understand there's gonna be questions, but we wanna ensure everyone has accurate answers to make sure they can have informed decisions about getting the vaccine. And that is the goal of this task force. I'll end just as I did uh, earlier in the week at our briefing. Our community does remain at a critical point in our fight against COVID-19. Our positivity rate is too high. Our hospitalization numbers and hospitalization numbers are too high. And we need to come together to bring that down. We can't afford to continue to see record high cases, an increase in our, in our daily averages and not change what we're doing. We need everyone right now to double down on their efforts to ensure our public health is maintained until we're finally able to return to that sense of normalcy that we all long for. We need to limit our social gatherings, maintain physical distance, and wear a mask whenever you leave the house. We know that these measures work and we need to continue to embrace them until the vaccine is available for wider distribution to the general public. We know that at some point this will end. We know that later on this year, will hit the herd immunity, I'm confident of that, and we can get back to that sense of normalcy. But as the vaccines are distributed and we keep adding to the numbers and increase the capacity week by week, we have to remember now is the time to double down on what we know works to, to reduce the spread of this disease so that we can get everyone vaccinated, keep everybody healthy, and get to the next stage in our recovery. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mike Mendoza. Thank you, County Executive Bellow. Uh, good afternoon and Happy New Year, and welcome to our first weekly COVID-19 briefing of 2021. And someday later this year, I look forward to having our last briefing uh, for COVID-19. It will be a day when we can look back and say we have finally beaten this pandemic. That day is in sight, and I'm encouraged by our community's efforts as we begin ramping up vaccinations throughout Monroe County. I will share numbers with you on that in a moment. But by the same token, that day is not around the corner just yet. We still have a ways to go. For now, we are not seeing a major post-holiday surge, but testing volume is somewhat erratic during the holidays, so it's hard to draw any firm conclusions. We are, however, seeing the effects of Christmas Day gatherings, visits with grandparents, aunts and uncles, and cousins, travel to other states, and I anticipate that the numbers are likely to grow in the coming days. 
We also know that nearly one in 10 of the people who are tested in Monroe County is infected with COVID-19. Our region's ICU capacity is decreasing and our hospital and other healthcare workers are stretched very thin and people are still unfortunately dying. Today, we are reporting 64 additional deaths spanning the range of dates beginning December 14th through January 4th. So please wear your mask, avoid gatherings, remain physically distant, wash your hands. This is how we put a lid on COVID-19 while we wait for enough people in this county to get their vaccine. And along those lines, I have some in in interesting progress to report. As of today, about 27,800 frontline healthcare workers have been vaccinated by one of two hospital systems. And the Monroe County Health Department has also contributed to vaccinating these frontline healthcare workers. We are continuing to work through our, our way through the phase 1A uh, eligibility criteria for vaccination. As the county executive just mentioned, the health department has also expanded its clinics for frontline healthcare workers who are not affiliated with one of the healthcare systems. Next week, we are already now scheduling almost 4,500 shots to be administered. We are vaccinating others who are at high risk, including EMS workers and funeral home employees. And we are reaching out to school nurses later this afternoon. Some of the first people to re receive the vaccine in Monroe County have already gotten their second dose. Several community-based vaccination clinics are being organized and you will hear more about these in the coming days and weeks. We are picking up speed, but is it fast enough? No, not yet. We ask for your continued patience as we continue to implement our vaccination plan in collaboration with the Finger Lakes Task Force, the Finger Lakes Vaccine Hub, and many other partners throughout Monroe County. Your turn will arrive, and I promise you, when it does, we will make sure that you know about it. So again, thank you. And with that, we will open it up to questions. Thank you. Our first question comes from Patrick Musikak from WHEC. Thank you. Um, county Executive Bello, Syracuse's mayor in conjunction with their county executive sent a letter to the governor asking that Orange Zone's uh, restaurants be allowed to open. Now considering they were shut down for a 3% positivity rate and now the entire state is more than double than that. Now as you know we've been asking the governor about this issue repeatedly. Are you and Mayor Lovely Warren considering doing the same and if not what has your communication been with the state about this issue? Yeah, we have talked to state officials about this, and I've talked to a number of local restaurant uh, owners about this as well. And I've said at previous briefings that I think that there's an inequity that exists, um, certainly between restaurants that are in the orange zone and those who are outside the orange zone. Um, and, it, and it also, my other concern, number two, is the long-term viability of restaurants. The longer we keep them closed, the longer that they're just open for takeout only, um, the harder it's gonna be for them to survive, particularly as we get through these harder, longer months of, in winter. What I think the path forward is that there should be a plan created very similar to how uh, the barber shops and salons were opened and how schools were allowed to be open when it went into the orange zone, is that the, a plan was created that involved testing criteria and it, 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 it in quite required capacity limits, social distancing limits, sanitation limits, and things like that, that then allowed them to be open in a safe way and prove that it was safe. So I hope that in the coming days and weeks that a plan like that can be developed that's acceptable to the state to, to bring that equity back, but also help our small businesses be able to survive the winter. All righty. And then my next question is for Dr. Mendoza. On Monday, we asked you if you heard anything from the state about the governor's reference last week to school testing in counties where the positivity rate was 9% or higher outside the already designated microclusters. Have you been uh, provided any clarification? Uh, no, Patrick, I haven't heard any clarification on that matter. Okay, thanks. Are you expecting any clarification? Let me ask you that before I go. We're always expecting clarification, uh, but we haven't seen anything on that, on that topic yet. Okay, thank you. Next up is Brian Sharp from the Democrat and Chronicle. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up. This would be for Dr. Mendoza on that question about the orange zone, yellow zone restaurants. Is there anything you can point to where you've seen any benefit from having 
the restaurants in those orange zones closed for indoor dining or versus risk for having the yellow zone ones open? In, you know, the challenge with this is that this is a natural experiment, what we call in science a natural experiment, meaning that there isn't a comparison group. So we don't really know if the effect of any particular intervention is necessarily uh, causal. So there may be an association which may or may not be causal, or that associ association may in fact be causal. Um, we really can't compare ourselves to other communities because every community is somewhat different. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't actually know what things would have been like had we not implemented uh, these precautions. So um, that's why I've said all along that we wanna do our best to follow the data. And as I've shown, uh, the correlation between positivity rate and zip codes doesn't necessarily correlate uh, with the orange and yellow zones, um, which is proof that the orange and yellow zones aren't just about positivity rates. So, you know, we're sort of feeling our way through this. And the reality is I can understand why people feel like it's unfair because in some respects it is. You know, when you've got one business literally 100 feet away from another with different zone designations, I can completely understand why that feels unfair. Um, but at the end of the day, we're not really going to know because this is, like I said, um, you know, there, there, there isn't, a, you know, a scientific uh, experiment going on here. We're not able to do um, actual comparisons between two different um, groups, if you will. Thank you. And, and one other, uh, I guess, follow up to you for, um, from earlier this week when you were on the call with Dr. Bennett, uh, you both spoke about the um, gaps in information uh, that you had, uh, be it um, who was getting vaccinated, how many were getting vaccinated in the nursing homes, how much vaccine was available. Do you have any of that information now today? And if not, how does that impact, I guess, your ability to do your job? Well, we don't have that information yet, and it, it will certainly impact what we do. But remember that we're in the very, very early phases of this, and, and we have the data that we need to, to get through the very initial phases. We're talking about healthcare facilities and we have a very good understanding of who within healthcare facilities and among healthcare workers has gotten their shots. So we're getting by right now. Um, but as we move in phase 1B, certainly, we're looking at an additional 100,000 Monroe County residents. Um, it will no longer be adequate to be uh, driving, if you will, without these data to guide the way. Um, and certainly when we have an eye toward equity and, and so forth, um, you know, we can't prove that unless we have the data to show it. And so, you know, we're getting by right now because it's still very, very early. Um, but this is something that we're continuously advocating for. And I am seeing some uh, signs of improvement at the state level. But, um, but, but those changes will have to be coming in order for us to, to make good on our promise uh, to, to be equitable and fair. Thank you, Brenda Clay Collins from WROC is next. Um, good afternoon. My question is for Dr. Dr. Michael Mendoza. Are you finding it hard to reach this group of healthcare workers that are in these private facilities? And what do you think is the biggest factor that's contributing to the slowdown of um, the vaccination process? Well, as far as the groups that are unaffiliated, it is hard. Um, you know, we have to leverage the relationships that we have through various associations in the, in the, in the community. So the Monroe County Medical Society for Physician Practices. Uh, the Genesee Valley Nursing Association for nurses, nurse practitioners, and others, um, working through the 7th District Dental Society, which is a regional. Um, and thankfully, we have relationships with all of these parties, but there are certainly going to be others that we don't have those uh, existing relationships, chiropractors, physical therapists, and others. And so that's why we're leveraging our connections and networks and media uh, like today. Um, and we're going to want people to go to the Monroe County website when we're ready to schedule all of those individuals. And um, those links are being developed as we speak. And so uh, we will continue to work on this. Um, you know, the biggest uh, slowdown, if you want to call it that so far, is the availability of vaccine. You know, we are far from where we want to be uh, to get the numbers of vaccines out there. You know, we are still focusing on 1A because that's what makes sense from a risk standpoint, but we still have a ways to go. You know, we think that there are 50,000 people in our county alone who fit that 1A criteria. And so we're not quite there yet. Um, but we're working very hard, uh, trying to communicate as, as quickly as we can and adopt, uh, adapt to a lot of the changing guidelines that we're seeing even every day. Thank you. My next question is for Adam Bello. You're talking about um, continuing this vaccination pause and establishing some more. I just wanted to maybe an update on the resources. Do we have everything we need as far as um, workers and vaccinations and locations? Well, we 
went through a process uh, uh, late last year of hiring additional COVID clerks uh, to be able to hit up our rapid, our rapid testing locations. Um, and, uh, and we're also going to be hiring additional clerks over the next couple of weeks, as well as vaccinators, to be able to stand up these pods. But it's going to be tough because you're also competing against other healthcare agencies and, uh, uh, and whatnot. In terms of resources, I'm hopeful I had a conversation um, uh, with Senator Gillibrand a couple of days ago, Congressman Morelli, about uh, another federal uh, stimulus package. Uh, and we're very hopeful that it will include resources for state and local governments to be able to stand up uh, and, and provide resources for vaccination pods. And I'm really grateful uh, for Senator Gillibrand, Congressman Morelli, and Senator Schumer's leadership and advocacy uh, for those resources. Um, what, what our goal has been has, uh, has always been to try to identify resources, whether it's by pulling back and making finding efficiencies within county government. We had a, a, a number of positions last year, as you recall, that had to go unfilled. Uh, and uh, we had to make a lot of mid-year budget adjustments in order to come up with funding to keep the government going and be able to double down on our efforts. We're gonna continue to do those adjustments uh, this year because the very first priority, number one priority of county government is the health and safety of our residents. So this is what we are investing in. Um, and we will expand our pod system to meet the need of the community. This is one thing that counties do have a plan on when it comes to a pandemic. I remember conversations when this started last year that there's really no rule book on what to do here when you have a full government shutdown. But where there is a rule book and where the county has participated in drills and really planning this out is the pod system, the pod strategy to be able to do mass vaccinations. And so. We're ramping up that pod strategy to meet that availability of the vaccine and to meet the phases. So the hospitals receive the first a tranche of, of vaccines uh, because uh, phase 1A started with healthcare workers inside the hospital systems. The nursing homes partnered with the federal government. And then as we move down the line of 1A, we start getting more community-based groups and private doctors, uh, offices that aren't affiliated with a system or you're having of home workers, things like that, we opened up our pod and expanded the availability within our pod uh, commensurate with the vaccine that we received and commensurate with uh, the new groups of people that are eligible. Um, where, where, there, where there's going to be a, a, a large increase in the number of vaccines that need, are going to need to be made available is when we hit um, that next phase that includes essential workers. Once we get into essential workers and we're looking at ramping up to close to 100,000 people, I think it'd be between 70 and 100,000 people here uh, in just Monroe County, that's where the pod systems really are going to have to be scaled up um, and they will be scaled up. That's what we're working for and hiring for right now. Um, but they're going to have to be scaled up to meet that demand. Um, and it's also going to present, a, present a, a different challenge than what we have now because right now you can break people into small groups. So you have you know, funeral home workers, you have uh, a dentist, you have uh, 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 private practices that are unaffiliated. Once you get to essential workers, what defines an essential worker? How do you reach out to them? How do you make sure that we're communicating with them and getting them scheduled and where they go for a vaccine is that piece that we're working on now. And we're working very closely. I just got off the call with New York State a couple minutes ago before this briefing. Um, we're working very carefully with the New York State Department of Health and uh, with the hub uh, in both hospital systems uh, to make sure that we're all coordinated in those efforts as well so that we're not stepping on each other's toes and that we also aren't competing uh, for the limited resources that we have. Thanks. You're welcome. Tanner, you've been built for other plans. You're up. Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to ask about uh, testing in schools. We've been hearing from some districts that they're going to restart testing. And I saw in a letter from uh, Web Webster that uh, part of that was based on uh, Dr. Mendoza's guidance, um, just given the positivity rates. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, where testing stands in schools uh, currently and moving forward? So as you know, I've been meeting weekly with the superintendents and that actually included throughout the winter break, uh, they were all working as I, as I was. And we talked about this because, um, you know, the risk in our schools has always been to some degree a function of the risk in the community around schools. And as we look at the prevalence increasing in the community at large, you know, the question really is how much longer can the schools continue to work together to keep COVID out of their schools and to keep COVID transmission 
out of their schools as well as they have today. And so, you know, one of the tools in our toolbox is to test. And so I invited them to consider testing voluntarily. Uh, we know that those who are in orange are required to test, but those in the yellow zones are not required uh, given the current guidelines. And so I said, if you are interested in testing, I would welcome that. We'll supply you the test. We've got the mechanisms in place. All of the schools in yellow and orange have done the testing uh, already. And so this would just give them additional information to, to inform their practices, to give them feedback about how they're doing, as well as to give some uh, feedback to a lot of parents who are rightfully concerned, knowing that the numbers have gone up in the community, seeing that the uh, hospitalizations have increased in the last month. I think this is a way of providing accurate reassurance uh, to the parents and to our community. Do you know how many are going to be testing? I know Webster's one, possibly Greece. Do you, are you aware of the number or a ballpark about how many will uh, tick, tick, uh, tick back no, up? I no, I don't know off the top of my head, but, but when they did a show of hands, almost all of them said yes, they're interested. Thank you. Okay, next is Noelle Evans from WXXI. Hiya, um, so for my first question, um, I've heard from folks who have been designated as essential workers who are wondering um, when will be their time? Folks who are working at liquor stores, grocery stores, um, if you could just address that, please. Sure, um, so, you know, it, it, it's gonna depend on a couple different factors when the next phase opens up. The factors are, uh, really the first biggest one, the availability of the vaccine and, the, and uh, how quickly the vaccine can be put into people's arms. Um, I suspect that that next phase is gonna open up in a couple weeks, um, but we will, but, it, but again, it's really going to depend on, um, on what that availability of the vaccine is uh, uh, from the federal government. Okay, and then to follow up, um, I'm seeing just a, a handful of, um, anti-vaccine protests that are happening locally. And I'm just wondering, um, Mr. Mendoza, Dr. Mendoza, if you could please uh, speak to that. You know, we knew going into this that we were entering uncharted territory with regard to vaccines. Um, there is some vaccine hesitancy already in our community around vaccines that have been tried and true for many, many years. And what we're dealing with here is a vaccine that is new, that was developed in under a year uh, using technology that is relatively new, uh, although not brand new. Um, and so it, there's understandably concern, and I understand that, and I appreciate that. In fact, I was seeing patients this morning, and I had a patient who was asking me very legitimate concerns as a healthcare worker herself, uh, who was initially hesitant. And so I guess what I would offer to the community is the same thing that I offered to my patients this morning. I said, let's talk about your concerns. Tell me about how you're feeling about this. Let's engage in a dialogue so that we can come to a place where we have understanding that's based on accurate information. And so I invite people to, to disagree. I invite people to ask questions. I think that's how we come to genuine understanding. And thankfully, we're still very early in this process. And so I think we do have some time. But as the weeks and months go on, I think that sense of urgency will uh, increase. And I also think that people's um, reluctance will decrease as we see more and more people go ahead of us, as we see fewer and fewer of these side effects that people are worried about. Um, and we learn more about the, the benefits of the vaccine. So I'm, I'm actually very optimistic uh, about how the next weeks and months will go. And, and I just want to underscore that, um, you know, right now, I, you know, in, in specifically in regards to the process, the vaccine is not mandated. What we're doing right now is going through the face and approach. And what, I, what we need to underscore, reiterate, is that we need to operate in facts. We need to talk, talk to professionals, we need to talk to doctors, and we need to talk to those who have the answers, who can answer our questions about how the vaccine works and the safety and side effects of the vaccine. We shouldn't be consulting Facebook and Twitter. This isn't a matter of public health. This is a matter of keeping our families and our neighborhoods safe and getting our community through a global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Patty Singer from Minority Reporter, you're next. Hi, thank you. So I, I wanna go through what family members should do when, they're, when someone in their household tests positive. I'm, I'm hearing stories on more than one occasion that someone in the house tests positive. The people, the spouse or the children are trying to check and see what they should be doing, but they're told, if you don't have any symptoms, go about your business. So these people are back out in the community, they're going to school, they're going to work, 
They're doing whatever it is they're doing, yet there is a confirmed case in the house. Can you please go through very clearly what the other family members are supposed to do when a housemate, whatever that person is, spouse or child, has a confirmed positive case? Can you just clarify that for everybody? Sure, Patty. So whenever anybody is uh, confirmed positive, they test positive, uh, we consider them a case. And anybody who is in close contact with that case, less than six feet distance for more than 15 minutes, which is generally speaking, everybody in a household, they will need to quarantine now for 10 days. That's an update in the guidelines, so 10 days. That quarantine period is 10 days because of the exposure. And so the 10 days duration of quarantine will not change whether there are tests that are done during that 10 day period, unless of course the test comes back positive, in which case that person becomes a case themselves. So anybody who is a close contact of a known case needs to quarantine. So again, we isolate people who are positive and we quarantine people based on their risk so that we take them out of the general circulation in the public so that we do everything we can to, to break transmission uh, in the community. So, so. And so let me, let me clarify the 10 days again, because I think this is probably a point of confusion. It's 10 days from the last date of contact with the confirmed case during that confirmed case's uh, isolation period. So the isolation period is 10 days. So that person is considered infectious or cont contagious for the duration of that 10 days. So for a household, unless the other members of that household can um, break contact with that first positive person, that 10-day quarantine begins on day 10 of the case's isolation period. So we may be looking at, you know, rolling periods of quarantine, and we've seen this throughout the community throughout this pandemic, and it, it can be confusing. You know, we are still working very hard to keep up. Uh, lately, we've been doing all right, but I do think that as numbers go up, we're likely to fall behind again. And so we want people to understand this guideline, um, but certainly within 10 days, we'll be in touch with, with, you know, families who are positive. But quarantine means you, I can't go to work. Work. I can't go to school. I can't go out of my house. I think maybe the quarantine and isolation terms have also confused people. I would think of quarantine as you're in, you're in the house, maybe in a different room from the confirmed case, but you're not going to school, you're not going to work, and you're not doing grocery runs. That's correct. Quarantine and isolation mean, in both cases, um, out of circulation from the general public. So if you're uh, a quarantine, you're not symptomatic, you're not testing positive, you still don't want you going to school or to work. And we are seeing examples of, you know, we hear stories from employees who say that their employers uh, maybe misunderstand the rules and are asking them to come in. No, when you're under quarantine, you need to stay home so that you protect other people in the event that you're harboring an asymptomatic uh, positive case. So in both cases, isolate or quarantine, uh, we want people to stay home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patty. Our final question comes from Seth Orton, Seth Spectrum. Hi there. Uh, being last, you've answered uh, probably the, the majority of the questions I had. Uh, we do get a lot of um, calls from people who, uh, you know, and I talk to them out on the street, uh, who are non-essential workers. And I know you've kind of laid out a timetable for vaccinations for a lot of folks. Uh, do, do you get a lot of phone calls, uh, maybe at your office, uh, from those folks? And uh, I guess what's the best answer you can tell them at this point as far as when they might be in line for vaccinations? We do get levels and I think that's a good problem to have. Um, you know, we don't want you calling your doctor's office just yet. The doctor's offices will communicate with you, particularly when we get to the point where we're vaccinating based on age and or medical uh, conditions. But when we're looking at the categorizations of, of quote, essential workers, um, we want you to consult with your employer and that your employer should have guidelines as to whether, you know, all or some subset of their employees is considered essential, quote, essential by the guidelines um, or not. So yes, we do get a lot of those questions. Uh, we're doing the best we can to develop a website that outlines all of this. Um, the state guidelines are still somewhat um, to be determined. Uh, if you look at the state uh, phase uh, uh, guidelines right now, phase 1B has a, actually a very short categorization of the different types of employees under phase 1B. So as we get into phase 1B, we'll put more specificity on those uh, types of, uh, of roles. But there are at least 100,000 people in phase 1B uh, here in Monroe County alone. And so we're going to do, have you do a lot more work to communicate about that to the public. 
Sure. And just, uh, yeah, one final question. Um, I know it was touched on early, but uh, hospital capacity uh, numbers at this point, uh, you're seeing a, with, with cases, I guess, sort of leveling off on that, that seven-day average, uh, where do things stand right now? Um, you know, I'm always a little bit cautious when it comes to predicting the future. I, I think, though, it's safe to say that the hospitalization numbers have plateaued. They're not going down by any stretch, but they certainly aren't surging. Um, but I do think we need to wait and see uh, what things show based on um, the numbers uh, from the holidays. Um, some of the models based on what we're predicting from at least Strong Memorial Hospital, who uh, does a lot of the teaching, um, they're expecting a 25% increase in the number of hospitalizations, which bears into how they structure some of their curriculum. And so there are some models that are being done from you know, very narrow points within the hospital, but they're all predicting, the bottom line is they're predicting an increase. And so I think we need to hold tight before we draw any firm conclusions about how things are going to look next uh, couple of weeks. Thank you. All right, that's it for questions. Nice. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, and actually right before we, uh, before we finish off, I just have one thing I uh, neglected to mention earlier. I just want to remind everybody, especially off the conversation between about quarantining and isolation, um, it is critically important to slow, in order to slow down the spread that we do get tested um, and we do as much testing as possible. Monroe County still has its uh, rapid testing uh, sites operational uh, in the city of Rochester, Irondequoit, Brighton, and the town of Gates. Um, so, so far, we've done 13,000. Uh, tests, um, and, uh, and those are still available. It's on our website, www.monroecounty.gov. Um, you can schedule your rapid tests in advance, or uh, we do take walk-ups and do as much you know, it, it work as possible to get to everybody who walks up, but I'd encourage you to do that. And next week's appointments, uh, in order to schedule an appointment, will be available tomorrow around noon. So you'll be able to schedule your appointment for next week uh, tomorrow afternoon. With that, thank you, everyone.